So I'll invite Dr. Anaga Haroor from Mumbai now. Um, she's a very eminent, um, prominent anterior segment cataract refractive surgeon in Mumbai with a large practice, and also is one with the highest number of votes yesterday. So the podium is all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Parul. Uh, at the outset, thanks for including me in your uh, IC. It's a pleasure and uh, I have uh, thanks for the uh, uh, votes also <laughs> and for all the support. So l my topic would be managing astigmatism as well as press biopia. So these are the two culprits that would cause a blurred vision to us, both press biopia as well as uh, astigmatism. So a simple monofocal today is not the uh, one-stop solution. The yardstick is the 2020 youthful unaberrated human eye, which obviously we cannot uh, meet, but we plan to meet. And the holy grail today is to give good far, good near, and good intermediate vision. But the challenges are not only in patient selection, but what kind of lens they would put, good patient counseling, and a precise biometry and surgery. Like uh, Dr. Parul has already mentioned, the first thing that you do in a patient for a multifocal workup is even before you touch the eye, you need to do the biometry. See that the cornea is pristine, the, no uh, anesthetic has to be put, there should, it should not be a patient where dilatation has already been done, though I know in very busy practices and if a patient has come from very far away and cannot come back again, Sometimes we end up doing it, but that's not the ideal way. And if you're planning a multifocal, then you should call the patient back. So in our practice, we make it a policy to repeat readings at least twice so uh, that you ensure that these readings are repeatable. Also look at the ocular surface topography, especially if you are planning a toric multifocal and OCT macula and also look at the scotopic pupil. So we already have seen how you can choose a suitable candidate and a person who asks too many questions is too finicky and has, uh, you know, going to keep coming back to you and always ensure that you have a relative along with the patient and explain to the relative also equally so that he understands what exactly the patient is going through and what he can expect. Avoid patients who are regularly driving at night, very cynical, hypercritical patients. Now, patient, for example, like this, you have to do a complete good clinical examination, slit lamp examination, and look at this, uh, if it's an irregular astigmatism, and that is why topography in these patients becomes very important. You could have a corneal wavefront, which is showing a vertical coma like this. So even if there is an EBMD, and you have not picked it up, especially if it's a dilated pupil and advanced cataract, sometimes it's very easy to miss these patients. So you can re go really awfully wrong, and these are red flags. Something like this, which is causing irregular astigmatism and can affect your visual outcomes. Now, this was a 65-year-old patient and that is why what I meant was when you do two or three readings and you see this variability in the K readings, it was basically a patient who was a chronic diabetic with a poor ocular surface, which will lead to discrepancy between the instruments also. In all our patients who have been high myopic, also ask for history of contact lenses and then uh, ensure that they are off lenses for at least a week before. Criteria for exclusion are all these preoperatively look for the look for changes in the cornea, macula, optic nerve, if there are any traumatic uh, uh, history of trauma, if there's any uh, zonular dehiscence, large angle alpha, which also probably it could be a hype, but if it's a high hypermetropia, then you need to be a little uh, careful. And intraoperatively, if you have, have a significant PC tear or a zonular dialysis, you have to take a lot of precautions. Now, coming to management of preoperative astigmatism. Earlier, uh, it was the general practice that probably point, less than 0.75, you go in for a plain multifocal and beyond that. But uh, I have moved away from this and I'll tell you what I do and where we discuss options of toric multifocals depending on the affordability of the patient or use uh, femto uh, relaxing incisions or LRIs and probably as we discussed laser correction in the second procedure. 
and yes like we said uh, already earlier if there is a misalignment of a toric lens why is it extremely important is if there is a problem in the capturing of the data if your keratometric reading is imperfect and your alignment is imperfect then you are bound to have imperfect visual outcomes and you need to be very wary in these patients even ensuring that the as i said data capturing if it's a tilted eye then you can see how a 1.74 has changed to a 1.9 and this itself can induce astigmatism so which is the best iol for my patient and today we are spoiled for choice and we end up being a matchmaker like dr parul has very clearly defined to us so now let's see a few uh, scenarios this is an against the rule astigmatism now i am here showing no financial interest i am here showing some cases which i plan on the verion but you can easily use the online barrett toric calculator for this now look at this patient if you can see in the top the cylinder is around 0.47 the flat axis is vertical so it's the against the rule astigmatism patient this patient has come to us for a uh, spectacle independence for cataract surgery it's a 0.47 how many of us would use a plain toric multifocal for this plain multifocal for this patient if it's a 0.47 conventionally we would say yes why not because it's even less than 0.5 right now let's see what happens with a 0.47 if i actually go and plan and i'm not considering posterior corneal astigmatism and i plan the eye the treatment and look at what the expected outcome says in the yellow the cylinder which is residual going to be at the end of surgery is 0.93 so a 0.47 has changed to a 0.93 which is i think quite high if you are planning a plain that's what that's what i'm just coming to it i'm coming to it so here as you can see the si is zero now if you have a 2.8 mm incision like i'm showing there si is 0.3 it comes down to 0.63 which is also not very less so you can plan you see here i have taken a non toric the tfnt 00 that's a non toric trifocal which is giving us a residual outcome of 0.63 now what if i choose a toric which is the next one and look at what happens to my residual astigmatism is 0.02 so which is better why should i leave behind a 0.63 when i can upgrade to a toric and get a residual of 0.02 that is for us to decide depending on how much perfection you are aiming at so this was the first so this was a t20 that we are taking and we are leaving behind a 0.02 now suppose you don't want to do this and the patient says i don't want a toric trifocal i cannot afford it at the same time i want spectacle independence what is the next thing you can do if you opt for the paired arcs as you as you can see here so there are these paired arcs that you can put and if you are using a femto you can use femto relaxing incisions and then again you can achieve a zero zero that means you can do one of the two both can work so this was a patient whom we had done like this and we finally achieved good outcomes now let's see another scenario which is with the rule as you can see here it's a 0.67 and flat axis is at 9 degrees so it is a with the rule astigmatism now if i consider the uh, tfnt 100 and no arcs so what is the one minute huh? so this is a 0.67 this is the yeah look at the cylinder that we are leaving behind is 0.19 and i'll just go back to this yeah this is the 0.67 minus 0.67 cylinder flat axis is 9 so it's a with the rule astigmatism okay here without the arcs see what is the residual astigmatism is 0.19 right so you don't need a toric here now with the 0.67 here with the plain trifocal and with an sia of 0.3 when you are adding it it is 0.47 which is okay so you can go ahead and put in a non toric now going to an oblique one again a 0.67 
with a residual you can see here of 0.79 in the yellow what would you do would you use a toric or a non toric if you are putting in an sia of 0.3 with a 2.8 you are getting a cylinder of 0.58 which is okay you can still go ahead with a non toric and if you plan a toric that 0.58 can be reduced to a 0 0 so again that is a call that you can take so what you need to do is basically go into your barrett toric calculator or if you have access to a verion put on this data and explain to the patient and you yourself can know whether you want to go in for a toric or a non toric option so these are the various ways that you can actually go ahead and do now since we are talking about treating astigmatism along with presbyopia if you have a digital overlay that's fine otherwise you can still do a very good job using markers system like this and surgical pearls you need to have an intact capsular bag a good perfect ccc a femtorexis would be even more ideal and you what you need to have is a good anterior capsular rim all around and wash off the visco elastic from behind the iol because here you are planning a toric you need to align it perfectly at the place where you want it and you don't want it to rotate and the most common cause of rotation in the post operative period is residual visco elastic underneath the lens so this is what is extremely important so the same thing you can do it without the femto so this was the patient where we had done the uh, femto relaxing incision also and the patient did well so this was the femto relaxing incisions there so the same things so intraoperative exclusion criteria suppose you have an event on table you need to take care keep a backup in all these patients and you have to take the call depending on the intraoperative situation what you want to do so a patient comes to you with spe needing spectacle independence three questions that we ask to our patients how much computer work is he doing how much reading per day and if he is doing any night driving so if he is doing regular night driving then it's a very important call that you need to probably avoid a diffractive trifocal for example and go ahead and use either an extended monofocal or an edof where the chances of glare and halos are less if the night driving is only at times or suppose it's just once in a while then you have to counsel the patient about glare if for the patient night driving is more important than spectacle independence suppose he has to do a bombay pune every night and maybe once in a while so then that becomes very important to him then again you give him a choice and tell him it's your call whether you want to do it or not we cannot guarantee that there would be no glare and halos okay if he is never going to do night driving then definitely the chances of glare and halos is much less you can maybe just mention it but you don't need to really dwell on it too much so if he is okay with the glare and halos then the next question is you ask how much of intermediate vision the patient is doing so here for example we have taken it as a computer work or a desktop if he is going to regularly do it then definitely you have to address it you cannot think of using a traditional bifocal for this patient you have to address it otherwise he is going to be extremely unhappy so a first choice would be a trifocal or an edof with a micro mono vision if he also wants good near vision then trifocal is important if he is okay with a reader and he just wants good intermediate vision then you can think of an edof but today with good edofs like minivel with a proxa combination or a lucidus you can have probably best of both if the patient is uh, doing computer work intermittently and is affording still i would go ahead and do a trifocal that is my lens of choice because see it's not only computer there are so many other activities where you require intermediate vision here we are just taking it just uh, uh, for the purpose of descript uh, description here so uh, if the patient cannot afford a trifocal then you need to counsel and he still insists there are some patients and he is not doing intermediate work at all but you have to explain to the patient that he would not be able to read his computer without uh, this um, trifocal if he is opting for a lower package because that would be probably the lower package in our case so here we would counsel him regarding that 
and if he's never going to do a computer work or this thing then maybe you can go ahead and do a bifocal but what is important is how do you decide the near addition so what we do in our practice is i had an interesting patient a patient was operated elsewhere with an id off was not told that she would need a reader so she could see 66 for distance she was fairly okay for computer but she could not read for near without glasses and her complaint was she wanted uh, to read without glasses then she came to me for the other eye and we actually measured where she was holding it and it was exactly 33 cm so we went ahead and put a synergy even though the principle of the eye was different in both the eyes thankfully even after completely explaining to her and counseling that the two eyes are going to be different she accepted it well she is happy that's another issue but what is important is at what um, distance the patient's maximum work is going to be you probably have to actually measure it and then you are sure that whatever lens you are going to use is going to be fine no matter what lens is chosen do not make a promise for 100% spectacle independence and yes just touch upon uh, the dissatisfied patient the seven c's is something we all need to remember always try to do the second eye as early as possible so that we can uh, have a better neuro adaptation residual cylinder is something which should never be left behind and that is why so much of uh, planning is required and early pco needs to be treated because it's going to reduce contrast sensitivity so you need to do a yag early if at all the patient develops a uh, cme could be missed and that needs to be diagnosed early look at the corneal uh, and ocular surface centration of the iol and yes there could still be glare and halos because in diffractive iols we know 18% of the light is going to be wasted so counseling of patients is important always undersell and over deliver thank you very much for your kind attention and uh, i always feel that our uh, multifocal patients are like your lovely wife or like a husband you give more time to him and he'll make life heaven for you otherwise it can be life hell for us thank you so much for your kind attention that was an excellent talk dr naga and uh, uh, just uh, one point i'd like to make that if we cannot do a femto uh, astigmatic keratotomy you can also plan a opposite clear corneal incision for those cases where you have a small cylinder 0.5 if you want to manage that can be uh, 